The podcast you're about to hear is a discussion of a horror film from 1974. A group of young filmmakers and actors produced a film in Austin which would depict the mad and the macabre as it had never been seen before in a motion picture. For director Toby Hooper, a low-budget film shot in sweltering Texas heat under nightmarish working conditions would go on to become a life and career-changing experience. The events of that summer shoot would change the face of horror and lead to one of the most bizarre films in the annals of American cinema history, The Texas Chain Saw Massacre. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres across a number of weeks. Now, we are currently in the midst of exploring the evolution of folk horror, and this is part eight, in which, as the intro suggested, we are going to talk about one of the most iconic and beloved horror movies of all time the texas chainsaw massacre now if you haven't seen the texas chainsaw massacre be warned we are going to be talking about the movie in spoilerific detail and please if you haven't seen the movie give yourself a treat go away and watch it i mean it's only the greatest horror movie of all time you know nothing major um so before we get started and i introduce my guest here are a few contact details you can email us the email address is evolution of horror at gmail.com or you can find us on twitter at evolution pod or on facebook that's facebook.com slash evolution of horror you can also find us on instagram at the evolution of horror and on letterboxd where you can keep up to date with what movies we're going to be watching this series and you can create your own little watch list and join in the discussion so that's at evolution pod on letterboxd but let's get started so much interesting stuff to cover this week so joining me to discuss all things texas chainsaw massacre i'm very very lucky and very honored to be joined by this week's guest he is the editor at large of total film but he also happens to be a huge horror and genre fan he's been lucky enough to have met toby hooper gunner hansen and he is the go-to guy when it comes to texas chainsaw massacre so i'm so lucky to have him here it is my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast for the first time jamie graham jamie hello hello how are you yeah i'm very good very warm uh, apologies for this little uh, locked room that we're in right now although yes. it, it kind of seems quite fitting for for what we're about to talk about <laughs> well it does i mean I'm, I'm sure we come on to this kind of extreme making of this movie as we <laughs> yes. go along but it's very intense experience. Uh, it was very hot, and that kind of can be seen in the film of discomfort. So oh we're, my God. we're kind of living it here yeah. now in this cupboard. So I, I feel at home. <laughs> That's what I was going for. It's probably outside right now, like the hottest day of the year yeah. or something similar, yeah. isn't it? And uh, we're in a little room with no no windows. So just to give you a nice visual there. Um, so first of all, just tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, just for people who don't know who you are, tell me sort of what you do. Well, I'm editor at large of Total Film Magazine. Wonderful. I'm a freelance film journalist, write for various titles. Um, basically been doing it about 20 years. Amazing. Um Love of my life, passion of my life is movies. Like most kids, I was into films, really enjoyed them. Got absolutely obsessive about them as a teenager. Started buying loads of VHSs back in the days. They were just starting to come out. And, um, you know, it was something like 35 quid to buy a new film in those yeah. days. A lot of money, like in the mid you know, late 80s. Uh, went to university with boxes of video cassettes, like new films, which other people didn't had, have at that time, such as my obsession. And it kind of went from there. And I did an English degree, but I knew I wanted to be a film journalist at that point. And um, just kind of spent all my hours watching movies when I wasn't done the pub anyway. And Love it. just had a great time. And then uh, luckily fell on my feet, kind of finished a journalism course after uni and got into film journalism straight away i was very lucky worked for a Love film it. magazine called flicks which you may remember used yeah. to be free in uh cinemas and went from there so all That's amazing all good i loved uh, i grew up total film was like my bible growing up and I, I remember actually keeping you know i had a sort of ongoing sort of growing pile yep. of issues one of my favorite ones that i used to read uh a lot was i don't know if you remember there was an issue I can't remember when it was. It would have been maybe late 90s sort of time uh, where they had like the 50 grossest movie moments. I do remember that. Do you that. remember that? Yeah, yeah. 
And I was obsessed with it. And at the time, I hadn't seen, I was quite young, and I hadn't seen most of them. But I just remember looking at all the pictures of all the disgusting <laughs> movies like Society yeah. and, and yeah. stuff like that and going, oh, my God. Making sure then over the next few years, I sort of ticked it, each one yeah. of them off. Yeah. yeah, that was before my time. I yeah. actually first started for the mag in 2001. Um, right, yeah, yeah. I do remember reading that article. Yeah. It stuck with me. It was great, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, so wonderful. good. <laughs> um, so tell me then, what's your kind of relationship like with the horror genre? Have you always been a big horror fan? Well, it started when I was eight years old that we had a VHS player, which, um, again, was quite new in those days. I yeah. mean, this would have been like 90. I was born in 72, so 1980, right. 1981. And we had a VHS player and my parents were in the garden doing something on a hot summer's day. And my sister sat me down to watch Friday the 13th, part oh. two, and The Boogeyman, uh, which obviously eight years old, I knew nothing about. The Boogeyman yeah. was actually one of the films that later got caught up in the video Nasties furor. He hurt bad children. Nah. And did terrible things to their mummies. But you can't kill the boogeyman. And I was eight years old and I sat down, watched them, and as you can imagine, kind of really scarred me. I was very traumatised by them. Uh, had to sleep in my parents' bedroom for the next six months, actually. Oh absolutely refused to go to my own room and uh, swore I would never watch another horror movie again. And then when I was about 13, 14, all my friends were getting into horror movies, as you yeah. do as a teenager, and I was having none of it. I just wouldn't go near it. And then one day a friend of mine insisted I watch Nightmare on Elm Street. He'd watched it a couple of times. He said, you have to watch this movie so I watched it and it absolutely terrified me but at the <laughs> same time it just bit me with a bug and I don't know if it's some deep psychological thing about confronting your fears all this stuff mm. I had in me from watching those movies when I was eight kind of confronting it or what but ever since that day that's it been obsessed oh. I mean I mean I love all movies all genres all countries everything but horror movies have always been my particular favorite Love it, love it. Um, so tell me, we've, we've been kind of, the way this podcast works, we kind of have, have been exploring sort of different subgenres. We did a whole series on slashers, but we didn't include the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, funnily right. enough. And then we did a, a whole series on ghost movies and that kind of thing. And right now, again, we'll get into how well Texas Chainsaw links to this, but right now we've, we've been talking recently about folk horror. Right. Um, what do you think of when you think of folk horror? When I think of folk horror, I think of movies that are very much kind of the power of a landscape, kind of ley lines, yeah. and kind of old, oldie worldy kind of English countryside. Yeah. Um, I think of stuff like, they probably are the most famous folk horror movies like Blood on Satan's Claw, course, Witchfinder yeah. General, um, The Wicker Man, kind of movies like that. And then right up to stuff like Kill List by Ben Wheatley. But yeah, I just think of those movies where they're normally remote, rural, away from uh, away from cities and yes. sort of modern technology, and it's almost like going back in time and like primeval. It is, isn't it? In yeah. a way. So, it's kind of it's kind of fear of the old or something, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's interesting because it feels like, and again, you know, who knows whether I, I suppose it's always been there, really. But it feels like it had quite a moment in the seventies, and yeah. and it does feel like you know people are talking quite a lot about it again at the moment, almost like there's this, this kind of folk horror revival going mm. on, movies like the witch and again ben wheatley's movies that kind of thing do you think there's any kind of reason for that any you know or is it just the kind of cyclical cyclical nature of these kind of things i think it's probably just the cyclical i can't say it either <laughs> nature of these kind of things that i think horror movies in general obviously go in cycles and yeah. you could say like in the 70s you know as we talk about with texas chainsaw there was so much going on in the world you mm. know so much like disruption yeah with vietnam war watergate crisis you know scandal yes. all, all of these things so many things and now obviously we live in a political climate which is also very very scary so yeah. so i think horror movies right now are having a real purple patch and it's kind of natural that you you want to explore your fears at this time whether that pertains particularly to folk horror or whether it's just mm. caught up in the whole cycle of it I don't know, but I would say maybe it's a case of directors grew up with the famous ones we've just been talking about, like yes. Wicker Man, and kind of were influenced by it and want to make their own. And also maybe it's a case of we're just so bogged down with technology now. You know, we're yeah. all constantly in our phones and iPads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But maybe there's something about just getting away from it all and being in that countryside and sort of being cut off from it and just getting back to Mother Nature, even if it's terrifying Mother Nature. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's still kind of nice escapism yeah, somehow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America. <laughs> the 
This is the movie that is just as real. Just as close. Just as terrifying as being there. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Well, the plot you can kind of fit on a postage stamp. Yes. It's basically five teenagers, late teens, who are in a Scooby-Doo bus and they're travelling through Texas and they're going to visit a graveyard because there's been rumours of desecrations of graves and one of the characters, well, two of the characters because they're brother and sister, their granddad is buried in the graveyard so they're going to sort of check out the grave, make sure, you know, it hasn't come to any uh, nasty business. Mm. And then they get there and... Uh, they're sort of going around and they get low on gas. So they go to a gas station. The gas station is out of, out of fuel because this is during the oil embargo. Um, so they decide to stick around for a bit until more fuel arrives at the gas station. And they go wandering. They wander around, happen upon this big old dark house, this big rural farmhouse. And inside it lives Leatherface and a family of uh, cannibals. And mm-hmm. they basically get it one by one in very nasty ways. So yeah, perfect. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, lovely. So first of all, simple question. Are you a fan of this movie? What do you think of this movie? I think it's the greatest horror movie ever made. I'm just going to go straight in and say that. Yes. Um, it gets under my skin like no other horror movie. The, the strange thing is there's many horror films out there, especially the movies I loved as a teenager mm-hmm. that I watched again and again and again, you know, 30, 40 times. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a film I've only seen four or five times. I watched mm-hmm. it last night ready to talk to you today and that was the fourth or fifth time I've ever seen it. And yet I can remember pretty much every frame of it. I watched yes. it. It was like I'd watched it, you know, the day before. It, it kind of burns into your mind's eye. There's something insane and nasty and gleefully sadistic about it. And it just gets to you and it stains you and it stays with you and you want to scrub yourself afterwards. <laughs> and it's just, you know, if horror movies are about disturbing you, unnerving you, all of those things, no other film does it as well. It's it's just It's incredible, wonderful. isn't it? I couldn't agree with more with everything you just said. I think it's the greatest horror movie of wonderful. all time. And it is it is strange. It is I've exactly the same as you. I've probably watched it four or five times max and and yet those images, every element of it stays with yeah. me. Every and it feels like there's something in it. It's almost like there's something in the celluloid. Every frame of it feels like it is designed to in some way make you feel uncomfortable, on edge, a bit sick, a bit dirty. You know, it's wonderful. I'm sure we'll go on to it later, but I think a lot of it is uh, just the conditions of the making of it. But it's almost Mm -hmm. pure chance that, not to say anything away from Toby Hooper, I'm actually a fan of quite a few of his films and think, you know, it wasn't a case of this was his only good film, but it is by far his best film. Yes. And I think a lot of it is the fact it was made in 32 days, you know, seven day weeks, 16 to 20, well, 12 to 16 hours a day. I think they were shooting in intense heat in the middle of summer, 1973 Yeah, in Texas. You know, they only had one costume like Leatherface, Gunnar Hansa playing Leatherface. He had one costume, so it's Stank B.O. It's kind of stood up to meet him in the morning. He put on his fleshy mask. It just absolutely stank. There's animal bones, real bones, carcasses, teeth, hair all around them. There's all these things. And it's almost like you said, it kind of seeps into the celluloid. It 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 kind of stains it. And when you watch the film, it has this terrible kind of buzzing insanity to it. (laughs) It does. But you come out, it's only 80 minutes long and you come out the other way and it's like you spent 80 minutes in an abattoir. It's just just horrendous in the best possible way. Yeah, that is exactly it. I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. First of all, just as a bit of background there, you mentioned this briefly mm. already. What's the kind of backdrop to this movie? What was going on in America at this point, you know, you know, in the real world? But basically, it was shot in the summer of 1973. So at the late 60s, you obviously had the civil rights riots. You had the rise of feminism. Um, early 70s, you had the Watergate scandal. You had the Vietnam War beaming into people's living rooms with all these horrific images. Um, there, there was all of this stuff going on um, and 
kind of as a wave of American horror movies of this time, kind of in the early mid seventies, yeah. which feeds on this. They're about the disillusionment and dysfunction of America. Um, and, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'm not sure if it could have been made before it was made or after it was made, really. Mm-hmm. It's such a film of its time. And if you want to understand the 19, early 1970s, you can almost come down from a spaceship and get get a print of this film and watch it and you'll kind of get a vibe of what's going on in the world at that moment yeah it's uh it's bleak isn't it and again you know you, different people have different um you know i think everyone's mentioned sort of different projects or real life events even that have come before it and what yeah. what inspired it the most you know people talk about psycho yeah you know the real life story of ed gein and yeah. uh, even movies like last house on the left yeah night of the living dead i mean yeah. what do you think if you were to link sort of one main inspiration from from any of those well i think you can't really choose one i think it's Mm. all of those that you've just said i think psycho kind of brought horror home away from transylvanian castles to kind of you know modern day america Uh, you had films like targets by peter bogdanovich that did the same Uh, night of the living dead very kind of graphic and you know no tidy resolution so yeah. impactful and it's got that dirtiness again, it, re- hasn't it really it? has it yeah. really has people gnawing on bones and the way it finishes on such a downbeat moment and yeah. all of that and then last house on the left a year before by wes craven again i mean it, it's just violence like you'd never seen on screen before it's got that same sort of grainy horrible almost docu-realism quality to yes. it um it's kind of it's actually got a chainsaw in it at the end the it father has. revs up a chainsaw to get his revenge on the on the hoodlums who have kind of uh, raped and killed his daughter and all of these things i think kind of feed into the texas chainsaw massacre mm-hmm. we were we were at a time when drive-in theaters were doing very well in america in america you had all these films be it messiah of evil or i drink your blood or yes. children shouldn't play with dead things but there's all these films going into drive-in theaters and toby hooper he was only 30 years old at the time and he said right I'm going to make a horror movie I'm going to make a horror movie like no one's ever seen before and he kind of took all of those influences plus what's going on in the world and kind of poured it into one film and took it further than it had ever been the film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths in particular Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother Franklin I mean, to start, I, I want to start at the beginning of the film, actually, and talk about those kind of opening few shots, because I think it's such a powerful opening yeah. as well. That kind of opening scroll that we get yeah. uh, puts me on edge from the get-go from that, and there's something about it that makes you feel like you're watching a real thing like you're yeah. watching news footage or you're watching something based on a true story yeah and it's not is it i mean obviously loosely there's the ed Gein connection but i i've heard and i've read and i've seen gunnar hansen talk about how people really thought that yeah. this was real and yeah. people came up to him and said i i had an uncle or uh, you know a friend yeah. who went to who shared a jail cell with you know whoever leatherface yeah. or whatever yeah. and yeah. you know it's so funny isn't it again do you think that's what is that what Toby Hooper was going for? Is he going for that kind of docudrama feel? Or I think he is. I think he's deliberately playing on the truth element. You know, that mm. opening scroll. I don't think it actually comes out and says it's a true story, but it does no. It does kind of say that, you know, the fate befell these teenagers, blah, blah, blah. And it's yeah. worded in such a way you think it's a true story. And then the images were all, they shot in 16 millimetre and blew it up to 35 millimetre for release. So it has that grainy quality to it. Mm-hmm. And they also shot on a very uh, slow film stock. So they needed loads and loads of light as well, which again added to the intensity because as well as the Texas sun, they were shooting with all these big lights, you know, 120 degree temperatures. A second body was found in a ditch near the perimeter of the cemetery. Subsequent investigation has revealed at least a dozen empty crypts. You know, it almost feels like a kind of prelude to found footage or something, yes. doesn't it, in a weird way? It really does. I, I think it has that feel to it, but at the same time, watched, watch now, you know, modern viewers, savvy as we are, you yes. can kind of totally see it's a narrative, but... But it was, I mean, he wanted to make a film about a family of Ed Geens, is what he said. So again, it has that loose connection Mm. as well. And there was definitely cases, like Gunnar Hansen said, you know, so many people at the time saw it and apparently drove in from driving theatres thinking they'd really seen a snuff movie. Because you you get so lost in it as the action goes on and it's so intense and so unremitting, so relentless, that you really do come away just feeling you've seen five people get tortured and brutally murdered. And yeah. 
It is, it is it's really... absolutely wonderful. And the difference between it and something like Last House on the Left yeah. is that Last House on the Left obviously does have quite a lot of real graphic content, a lot of yeah. blood, that kind of thing. Whereas, we'll get into this later, I'm sure, but Texas Chainsaw pretty much is a bloodless movie, it feels like, as well. The incredible thing with Texas Chainsaw, there's one scene in the whole film near the end where Leatherface falls over and the saw lands on his leg and you literally get a second, maybe even half a second, of yeah. the blade biting into flesh. Yeah. And apart from that, that is the only one wound you see inflicted there is no spray and blood you know no. sort of archeries opening no eli roth type stuff it is all shadow suggestion it's almost like a val luton movie from it like is. the 1940s it's really odd and yet it's done so intensely like the editing is so brilliant the art direction is so fantastic oh. all the bones and nails and teeth and like we said it kind of stains you but you watch it and you really do think you're seeing everything and you come away especially those first couple of watches when you're really caught up in the moment i mean mm -hmm. my third and fourth you can maybe step back a bit and kind of analyze it a bit more but the first time you see it you come away thinking you've seen people being sawn in half yeah. like guts falling out all over the place and you don't see any of it toby hooper actually wanted to make a pg movie this, <laughs> this is a <laughs> weird thing he was talking to the mpaa the american ratings board like mm. while he was making it and saying how can i hang someone on a meat hook and get a pg rating <laughs> And they were saying, well, don't show any blood. And, and he didn't. And then, of no. course, when it came out, it didn't matter because it's like a stick of rock. It's just all pervasive violence from first frame to last. <laughs> yeah. And actually, funnily enough, I had someone from the BBFC on the podcast and he was talking about the difficulty in, mm. in rating a movie like Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. in that, obviously, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but the way that it was, basically, it was banned, wasn't it? It yeah. was pulled from, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't out there um, originally. And because there was nothing they could cut no. really to make it acceptable it was the whole overall tone it was yeah. the mood yeah. basically like they they made out it was almost just too scary yeah. that that was like what they how yeah. they described it which is but, wonderful yeah isn't james it? Furman, who was obviously like chairman of a bbfc then he described yes. it as a pornography of terror and that kind of sums it up and you know i don't agree with a lot of stuff that James Furman mm. said about this film and about a lot of horror movies in general and the way he treated them. But that statement does kind of sum it up. <laughs> it kind of fits, yeah. yeah. Um, so when, when when the movie starts as well, so you've got that kind of, that, that really iconic sound effect of the yeah. camera, the kind of... <laughs> um, and I thought this would be a good chance to ask you about the sound design, because I, it, the, it, as with all horror, I suppose, but sound design in this movie is so key, isn't yeah. it? I mean, yeah. there's not really music. There's some kind of thumping, weird drone noise so or something, weird, isn't yeah. there? I mean, what is that sound design, do you think, and what does it add? Well, Toby Hooper, when he finished shooting the movie, he actually went away for a year, or well, almost a year, to edit it. And mm. he was editing it in his living room, and he was kind of overseeing the score in his bedroom. And basically, he used all... He was just into kind of experimental music. So he used toys, he used tambourines, he used all sorts of clanging, like, dissonant noises, like rumbles. And he put together this kind of... a uh, this hellish soundtrack, which is unlike anything you've heard before or since. And like you said, it's not really music. It's kind of clanging and it's like just rumbling. And the strange thing is you can actually see the influence in films since. Like everyone's talking about Hereditary at the moment. As we're recording this, it only came out a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And that, again, it has all through that film, it has this kind of bass rumble. Even during yeah. the domestic scenes when they're just sort of standing around talking, there's this bass rumble, almost so low in the mix, you can't hear it. You kind of feel it more than you hear it. Yeah. And Texas Chainsaw was doing that in 1974, you know, and Irreversible, the Gaspar Noe film, yeah. that does it as well, that there's this kind of rumbling, picnic at Hang It, at hanging rock which is 1975 peter weir did that as well he has this kind of rumbling and it gets in your guts and it churns them up and it's just all about constantly putting you on edge yes yes and again it's not so um it's not so cinematic that it takes you out of it again it, it all adds to that realism of it's almost like you 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 almost don't hear it but you yeah. do you know yeah. it's 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 subtle in a way isn't it yeah. there are these moments of sound that emphasize these mo like you know, these terrifying moments but at the same time you're not noticing it not like you notice the psycho shower score no. or the john no. carpenter halloween score or something no. like that yeah no, it's really it's really odd and it's also it's there and the editing kind of matches it as well but if you yes. watch this film carefully 
all through the film, Toby Hooper cuts when you don't expect him to cut. Yes. I mean, he cuts a lot. It's quite an aggressive in-your-face film. You know, there's not many shots that are really held for ages and ages in a classical sense. No. You know, it's very assortive. But he always cuts when you don't expect it. You know, he doesn't cut on the beat of action. He either cuts like half a second before or half a second after. If someone's about to speak, he cuts. Yeah. And it just basically, it's almost subliminal. But right from the first frame, it just puts you, it puts your hackles up. There's something wrong here. Yeah. Yeah, that is so interesting, isn't it? It's everything, every every sort of technical decision behind what he's done yeah. it all adds to it. It's so clever. Um, and then we've got these shots as well of these kind of this dead corpse that is kind of <laughs> assembled in this almost like kind of ritualistic fashion, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. And this is where I thought it would be good to talk about you know this film in in relation to folk horror because obviously yeah. everyone does think about folk horror as yes blood on satan's claw and and obviously this isn't traditional folk horror a lot of people would argue this is a slasher movie i suppose mm-hmm. but i feel like there's something about it that feels tonally so different to a slasher movie yeah. to me yeah. um I, I i feel like but i was kind of trying to figure out where is best to put this film and where is best to and i thought you know this movie has this sense of uh earthiness and this yeah. kind of focus on the landscape yeah. it feels like the the surroundings the rural setting is so yeah. important yeah um the kind of old ways meets new modern kind of liberal ways yeah. and all of that kind of yeah. thing i mean what are your thoughts on that i mean have you always thought of texas chainsaw as a slasher I don't really think of it as a slasher movie, mm. even though it clearly is one of the kind of proto slasher movies it that it's a big masked guy sort of killing teenagers, you know. And so you can definitely see why people class it as a slasher movie, but it feels almost like unto itself in a way. Yes, and what it's you're, completely unique, isn't what, it? Yeah. What you're saying about the folk horror element is definitely there in that it's set in Texas, it's these big barren kind of really sun bleached landscapes yeah and daniel pearl's photography is absolutely amazing you've got shots of the scooby-doo bus tracking along the very bottom of the frame yes. and there's a huge sky towering above them kind of weighing down on them like a big john ford sky and then you've got amazing shots of like sunflowers you've got the sun burning in the sky you've mm-hmm. got all of these things he really gets a feel for that landscape and like you said, that opening scene with the almost scarecrow type thing of, yes. of a corpse, it almost feels like some sort of ritual pagan type thing, which again, yes. when we think of folk horror, often it's tied in with sort of paganism or some sort of weird culty type thing. And even though the film doesn't go down that path and it doesn't really no. explore that and it's not some satanic cult or something like that, yeah. it does have that element to it. And the same with a hitchhiker when he gets in the back of a van. It's yes. like what he's doing away, he's smearing his blood over the van and stuff it's almost like you know he's marking a territory marking and it's them. some sort of ritual it's it's really odd yeah i agree and there's this feeling as well i mean i know predominantly it's this family but there is also this feeling that it's this whole community yeah. that they've stumbled into yeah. that are all a bit off or a bit yeah. odd. Uh, yeah. That moment when they go to visit the grave and there are those other characters that you yeah. see momentarily, that strange sort of old man who's sort of lying backwards On in the, the grass. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. that is such a weird moment. And again, it's these little these little uh, moments where you think, oh, it does, you know, in some ways have some links. I was reading a book by Adam Scoville who's written a lot yes. about folk horror and he, yeah. he, he basically was arguing for movies like Texas Chainsaw in that he kind of he came up with a list of kind of basic rules for folk horror which is kind of rural setting focus on the landscape the uh, and then the sort of next step from that is kind of isolated communities with old strange different traditions <laughs> yeah. which then leads to uh, either something supernatural or something dangerous happening yeah. to these other yeah. characters that find themselves within yeah. that world kind yeah. of thing so it, in some ways it kind of ticks those very very basic boxes yeah. which I yeah. find quite interesting we kind of veered off from doing movies like Straw Dogs then into things like Deliverance and, and yeah, there yeah, it yeah, kind of yeah. feels naturally like you could go into those kind of exploitation type totally. movies I yeah. suppose yeah it's kind of backwards type things yeah. but there's definitely that sense for the community we only meet a few peripheral figures and only for a few seconds here yeah. and there but everyone just their faces the way they speak it's, yes it's very much got that kind of city the city livers or city dwellers fear of the countryside and exactly the kind of rural bumpkins and they all you know were used to work in slaughterhouses and mm-hmm. in farms like you know with cattle dying etc and now all those abattoirs are closed because it's you know obviously 
the uh, economic downturn of America. It reflects all of that. Yes. But it is, it's very much a community that is, it's in its own little world, almost like away from civilization. And if mm-hmm. you go there, you go there at your peril. And funnily enough, they, they, they that, that, that becomes more of a thing in that remake, the one that Michael Bay produced. Oh. Ten of, yeah, yeah, I know. Terrible. But there was, the, the, there is that moment when the, um, the main, the, the main girl, she's kind of running away and she thinks she escapes to a trailer park and there are some, what she thinks are friendly faces and then they right. all turn out to be all part yeah. of that community yeah. that know the family yeah. and lead her yeah. straight back into it. So again, they kind of play on that aspect of the whole community, the whole village, the whole town or whatever you call yeah. it. Are there's in a, there's on a, it, a lot of films thing. like that now. Like yeah, there Eden, are. Eden Lake being an English example. Yeah, Eden but, Lake, yeah. yeah but yeah, I mean, talking of a remake, I'll just get this story in quickly because yeah, cool. when it came, I actually don't think it's too bad that of all the Texas Chainsaw films over the last few years, it's probably yeah. the better one that... You know, it at least has an intensity to it, you know. But um, it's Platinum Dunes, which is Michael Bay's company doing horror movies. And I actually interviewed Michael Bay for it when it came out. And he said to me, and I'll tell you, I I really had to bite my tongue on this one. But he said to me, like, I was saying, why have you remade the kind of holy grail of horror movies? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, have you seen Texas Chainsaw, the original lately? He said, it just doesn't hold up. Oh. That's when you know you're not in the right hands. When (laughs) someone says that, I'll tell you. That's all you need to hear, isn't it? That's all you need to know about Michael Bay. If I'd had any balls, I would have got up and walked out. I'll tell you. That's what I should have done. It's so funny. Because, again, I don't know whether it's prior knowledge of knowing that you're watching something that Michael Bay is involved with. Yeah. But there's something about that film as well that feels so much more leery. Yeah. And even though some of the shots are actually repeated from the original, like the kind of very low shot of the girl walking towards the house in the yeah. sort of little denim shorts, yeah. Yeah. somehow in Texas Chainsaw, in the original, it doesn't feel... Uh, leery or exploitative it kind of feels like again it's the kind of low angle focus on the ground on the earthiness on the you know and yet when you watch Michael Bay's version I feel like we're looking up the girl's skirt (laughs) yeah no it does have that leeriness like we all know how you know the Transformers films with Megan Fox yeah has like to uh, have an obsession with her ass, you could say, and yeah, um, yeah. it's definitely there in Texas Chainsaw as well. But it's interesting what you say about that, um, the original, because again, this to me is why it doesn't feel like many of the slasher films that follow. Yeah, is that sex just is not a part of this film. Yes. There's, there's maybe a couple of moments, like yes, the two women in the film wear sort of skimpy outfits, but you still don't feel it's really. But it's so hot. It is so hot. <laughs> it's so hot. Yeah, and also you know, there's one scene at the dinner table scene which I'm sure we talk about later but there's a moment where Leatherface goes up to Sally and he starts sort of rubbing her face and it's almost like he's thinking oh you're you're really pretty I like you and there's that moment but apart from those moments yeah there's no sort of sexuality there's no leering in it anything like that it is just meat this is a family they are pieces of meat in meat you know they used to be at the slaughterhouse now they do their barbecue which is obviously like human barbecue and all these people invading their house going by like opening their doors coming in the windows and they just like kill them and cut them up and make barbecue and that that's it you know? yeah it is a brilliantly hilariously sexless movie yeah. isn't yeah, it totally. there, there is that moment again at the dinner table where Sally kind of goes I'll do anything I'll do anything you mm. know to get mm. away again suggesting and they couldn't care less not no. interested at, at all it no. might as well be a, 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 a yeah a, a cattle sort of tied up there in that room like, it? yeah I thing. mean all of the scene again the dinner table scene which we'll talk of later but mm. all of those moments when she's tied up and they're tormenting her and Oof. you know it, it goes on for what seems like hours and hours and hours <laughs> yes. and it's only actually eight minutes of film time know, that dinner table scene it's incredible but all of the time that they're sort of poking at her and shrieking at her and laughing at her and it's this sort of gleeful sadism to it none of it is sexual no. there's no moment where there's a tied up woman in the chair and they're sort of doing anything leery or no. touching her in a way which is you know horribly suggestive or anything yeah. like that or brutally sexual it is all just like making fun of her and tormenting her but not in a sexual sense I know this is what's, what's so clever about it this heat is just driving me crazy I don't Listen, know if I can take much more the condition of retrogradation is contrary or inharmonious to the regular direction of actual movement in the zodiac and is in that respect evil. Hence, when malefic planets are in retrograde, and Saturn's malefic, okay, their malefice is increased. Have you been doing those Reader's Digest word power columns again? Gary, it just means Saturn's a bad influence. Okay, so then, yeah, I mean, let's talk about some of these characters then. Yeah. These characters that we get, you know, they're not... And again, I suppose this is the kind of slasher uh, uh, link, I suppose, because we don't find out a hell of a lot about these characters. They're not the most no. well-drawn no. characters in the world. Or maybe It feels like Franklin, maybe, yeah. might be the most kind of 
characterful character in a way. Yeah. Might yeah. Be. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? On the, the bunch of kids that we get. But this is a thing I, I've always believed. You know, you always hear with horror movies, you have to really care about the characters to mm-hmm. to feel scared. Because if you don't, you know, feel for them, if you don't invest yeah. in them, then why should you give a shit about what happens to them? And that's something I very much believe in in 99% of cases. But in yeah. Texas Chainsaw, it's a kind of exception <laughs> to the rule. Because like you say, the, the five characters, they're all kind of cardboard cutouts. We don't really mm. get to know any of them. They just sort of wander around and Franklin bitches and moans a bit. <laughs> and then they sort of uh, meet their face and that's it. And yet for some reason you know yeah it doesn't feel like a big deal in this yeah Yeah. i know it's strange that isn't it um they there's these conversations they have actually i mean mean, actually to be fair to them as well i do think the performances are good they are good with what little they do and what little they have to work with they're convincing none of them are kind of jarringly bad no no no. um particularly sally and franklin who really you know get put through a lot throughout the film don't they um but uh yeah again you know these moments of where they're in the van at the beginning and the other girl is kind of reading this kind of astrology stuff. Mm. What do you think the meaning was behind all of that? Is that just a kind of foreboding, you know, danger is coming for them? I think? I think it is. I yeah. think it's just all about, you know, just like we said, putting the hackles up. I think right from the first frame of this film, there's something off of it. Yeah. And nothing really happens for the first half hour. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're, just, they're just in the bus. They pick up a hitchhiker who's a bit weird and, you know, he does a few odd things like, you know, slices his hand with a knife and mm. smears some blood and, you know, all of that. And they kick him out and they don't actually get to the farmhouse and they don't start the killings don't start till you know over half an hour in and yet that first half hour of the film is really unnerving it's unnerving it is never boring as well the film is never boring and even moments like uh which we'll get to the sort of pacing of it is really brilliant because there are moments in my head i remember thinking when it got to the big chase scene in the dark oh this goes on forever now and i timed it and it's like four or five minutes incredible yeah it's amazing um franklin would you think there's any problem is there anything problematic these days in this day and age with having this character in the wheelchair who is basically just this big annoying burden (laughs) well let's put it this way i don't think they'd do it these days without exactly yeah no no one would ever go down that route where you've got five people one of them is in a wheelchair and he's just a whining git (laughs) from start to finish and it's quite interesting actually the the actor who played that role like we said none of them are real kind of proper actors they're mm. just starting out or they're college students etc they're yeah. non-professionals so he felt he couldn't pr- play fl- franklin going in and out of a character so paul partain who is actually playing franklin he stayed in character for the whole 32 days they were shooting Brilliant. the film so he stayed in the chair he whined between takes all the other actors didn't like him nobody liked him and you know us as a viewer don't like him that he just he's he does this horrible thing as well where he goes wee, 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 wee. Oh. <laughs> come on franklin it's gonna be a fun trip and anyway to go back to the point no one would do that nowadays um mm. so I, d- I don't know i mean but, but then is that just too being too cautious on you know I mean, the, maybe it is because in a way i mean he is the most engaging character in the film he is, you, he is. you could say that but the other the others have not got a lot to them no i mean what makes sally is obviously marilyn burns he's playing her she's got the greatest scream in movies you talk yes, about does. scream queens like going back to faye ray and janet lee and stuff no one screams like marilyn burns for the last like 20 minutes of that film it is constantly serrated high pitched screams which just shatter your eardrum and go right down to your soul and Mm -hmm. um you know that's kind of what makes her but the one the character who's got the most dimensionality in a way is franklin yeah yeah it's so funny isn't it it's really interesting and of course Leatherface and the family. Oh, I suppose brilliant. they're the real characters they in are. this, aren't they? They are. Uh, the Hitchhiker is a great character, actually. And actually, in some ways, I find him the most, in some ways, the most frightening as well. That's interesting, he seems yeah. the most sadistic. He I is suppose. the most sadistic. Yeah, isn't yeah. he? There's something about him that where he enjoys it yeah. a lot more than the rest of them do. Yeah, because the you, you've got the kind of uh, pop character who's, yes. you, you know, a lot of people don't know watching the film is he meant to be the father to mm. the other two or, or is he the brother? He's actually meant to be the brother but the guy jim cedow is playing pop he kind of um he he varies at one minute he seems quite nice and he's you know he's worried about the house and keeping everything in order and you know he's he's got a kind of a nice cleanly side to him and then he's got a sadistic side to him as well when he's poking you know sally with the broom and laughing at her and prodding at her and stuff like that 
And then Leatherface is an incredible character. That, incredible, yeah. yeah. He's like the mother of a family. He's the baby of a family. He's vulnerable. He's terrifying. Yeah. You know, there's 22 stone madman. But there's so many different sides to his character. But like you said, the hitchhiker is the one who is just an evil little git. Yes, he is. Yes. He really is. He's the he's, one you would not want to be around. Yeah, yeah. He, he seems completely unhinged. He's kind of, you know, that scene where they chuck him out the van and mm. they drive off and he's kicking at the van and slashing at the van and he's just always has this goofy grin on his yes. face and he, he he's the sort of guy who would cut you up and laugh while he's doing it yes know? exactly and the whole sequence with him the hitchhiker in the van is so brilliantly weird yeah. and tense and yeah. what the hell you know and all of their faces say it all basically it really you know does. it's yeah. so so brilliantly real i was at the slaughterhouse i got an uncle that works at the slaughterhouse hey my, my brother worked there my my grandfather too <laughs> my family's always been in me and that, you know these conversations that they have as well about again the slaughterhouse mm. again this kind of build up of the, okay this family they don't like to do things the modern way they don't like to use the gun they like yeah. to use the sledgehammer yeah, yeah. Uh, it gives them a better kill or whatever yeah. it is they say yeah. they die better or something it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, and there's a lot of kind of I suppose animal imagery in this mm. as well it's something we talked about when we were talking about other um, movies like even Night of the Hunter and, and and a couple of British folk horrors as well a lot of a lot of animal comparisons yeah. to the yeah. characters and in some ways all of these characters they're like lambs to the slaughter yeah they really are um, Leatherface makes kind of weird animalistic that you think he might be a pig to begin yeah. with or some yeah. sort of he does crazy pig squealing yeah animal character yeah Gunnar Hansen actually went to pig farms and like listened to pigs and stuff to try and get that it's absolutely horrendous but, um, yeah I mean this may be taking it too far this may be a film journalist sort of digging deep for subtext <laughs> that isn't there but i've always felt from day one there's a weird vegetarian subtext to this film that, mm. that basically you've got you've got the humans and you've got the animals and the film makes no division between them and gunnar hansen's actually said the moment in the whole film that he finds most disturbing is a close-up of a cow's face where it's kind of just slobbering you know when yes the, the uh, bus is driving past and and all these guys, they used to work at the slaughterhouse. They used to kill animals for a living and, you know, no one blinked. That's just accepted. And now, obviously, they're just killing humans as if it's no different. It's all just yeah. meat. And, you know, it's, it's a weird one. It's, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. That's, that is a weird... I noticed that. What felt like for the first time watching it this time around, that weird cutaway to the cow. Yeah. Uh, just kind of comes out of nowhere as well yeah, that, that yeah. shot it's, it's very really odd. weird and then there's obviously the dead armadillo at the start of the film of course, and all of yes. this which you know there's a lot of animal imagery in it and Robert Burns the uh, art director he actually sort of went around the local farms and found real sort of dead carcasses of animals oh, and I think he like he got a skeleton from India at one point because it was cheaper to do that than buy a oh, plastic skeleton and he, and he was going to the vets and all this and getting real like bones animal bones and teeth and decorating all the house with it and it's and then there's that chicken in the canary the chicken, cage which yeah. is terrifying in horrible, its own right just absolutely cooped horrible. up and like yeah it's just that constant animals and humans just mm. put together and like we said you know where is the division why is it okay to yeah. kill all the animals and it's you know not okay to kill the humans yeah from the family's viewpoint from the cannibals you know these humans are on their land they're sort of trespassing and you know why not kill them and have a nice bit of barbecue <laughs> Hey, pal! Uh, let's get to it then. The, the, the incredible moment where they do sort of wander into Leatherface's house for the first time. I think it's like my one of probably I think one of my favourite moments in, in horror or yeah. in cinema. Yeah, the and first they... the first time we see him when he approaches that door, he hears first of all that sort of pig noise, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Walks in. And then there's just that oh. very quick slam on the head with the hammer, the kind yeah. of twitching body. Dragging him behind the door, slamming it shut, yeah. and then that drone noise. Yeah. I mean, wow. what, that is just one of the most powerful moments, isn't it? Well, again, it is because it's there's no warning to it. The yeah. bizarre thing is, we've said the first half half hour of the film is unnerving, and mm. you're kind of watching it, and something clearly isn't right. But having said that, it's just kind of ambling along, and yeah. then they go to the farmhouse, and you know, it's quite a nice house from the outside, and it's all very sunny, and you know, sunflowers and stuff. And then yeah. Kurt goes into the uh, house and 
He's just walking down the corridor and next thing you know, he gets a mallet on the head. He's twitching on the floor in a death rattle. He's pulled through the door and uh, this like steel slaughterhouse type door is slammed shut behind him and, and it's over. It's over in like two or three seconds. And, you know, back in the day, if that was Hitchcock in Psycho or something, there'd yes. be that. There'd be the usual overhead shot, which is almost sort of a forewarning to the audience. Something horrible yes, is going to happen. you're right. And then like, you know, Norman Bates would stagger out the bedroom and, you know, something like that. But it just happens. And when it happens, it's over so quick. It's almost like, did I imagine that? Yeah. And then after half an hour of a film with nothing happening, as we've discussed, you then get this kill you get the second kill and you get the third kill almost back to back they happen all really quick really brutal really fast and it's just like what the fuck what's happening it is talk about unnerving you and then uh, just brutalizing you you know by that point 40 minutes into the film you're just like i don't know if i can watch the next half yeah it's so brilliant that and i forgot again until re-watching it how quickly in succession those three yeah. deaths are how quickly yeah. you go from five of them in the group to then they're just being franklin and sally yeah. left yeah it's, it's insane amazing. and yeah the, the 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 quick and there's something so I guess it's just cold. It's the coldness of it, of the yeah. way that these victims are yeah. just disposed of so quickly, yeah. so kind of nonchalantly. It's just yeah. like slam, gun, like you say, th- a few seconds, yeah. you blink and miss it almost. You know? Pam, the second killing, I mean, she basically goes into the farmhouse after Kirk, who's yeah. now disappeared, not knowing what's happened to him like we do. This is only, you know, a couple of minutes after. And there's a wonderful shot where she gets up off the uh, swing and the camera goes under a swing and mm. she's kind of there and the house is looming in the background yes. above her. It's just a wonderful shot. Her. And it's also where she's wearing that skimpy outfit, you just see all of her back as well, her bare back, which is great for what's coming up because yes. it sort of prepares you without realising you're being prepared. Yes. But Again, she, it's that feeling that she's just meat. Yeah, she's, yeah, just, she's meat. just meat. <laughs> and But well, she goes into the house and she stumbles in this front room, which is full of feathers and teeth and bones and animal things everywhere. <laughs> Like almost, you know, in a skimpy outfit on the floor, like just knee deep in all this Ooh. horrible animal grew. And then she's running out the house and Leatherface appears from nowhere. 22 stone, massive guy, Gunner Hanson. He grabs her, picks her up like she's a feather, you know, takes her out in the back, hangs her on a meat hook, which is where seeing her bare back comes in because mm. it's just, you know, there's no harness there, there's nothing. He just goes plonk on the meat hook. Yeah. And then, like you said, the fact it's so cold because he then doesn't pay any attention to her he just puts on a hook and then turns around revs up his chainsaw and starts cutting up Kirk yeah in the foreground it's like well she's there ready for later and yeah he just doesn't care about her and again it all happens in a few seconds and again it's all suggestion the first time you watch that film you swear blind you see that meat hook penetrate skin yes. you know you've never seen anything like it. it's the most disgusting thing you've ever seen you watch it again you see absolutely nothing and yet it still somehow is one of the most disgusting things you've yeah. ever seen it's yeah. it's the way it's filmed it's the way that it's lit it's kind of like yeah. grime it's sort of like di- sort of dimly badly yeah. lit that that shot well, this, as well this is it? where it really feels like a snuff movie it does it, it does it's, it's like shot like if you or i just picked up a camera and went yes. into some you know backyard into a shed and shot it, you know it, it's just it really doesn't feel professionally done it's just they go in they hang on the meat hook as a terrible jerk as she mm. sort of you know goes on that meat hook where it sort of catches in her spine or sinew or whatever yeah and then the camera goes down and you see this big tin bucket beneath her feet yes. and you don't see it like loads of blood pouring into the bucket because it's a bloodless movie but it's there ready to yeah. sort of drain her like you know Ed Gein they found that woman in his shed in his back shed hanging upside down by her feet and she'd been gutted like a deer and yeah. it's kind of that idea and it's just horrific and then he turns his attention to Kurt to cut him up with a chainsaw and again you hear a chainsaw you see a bit of smoke and you know you you imagine you're seeing it biting into flesh but you yeah. don't see anything it's all off camera you do not see any blood spraying anything no it's craziness isn't it and it's it's even quite funny really that the film is called the chainsaw massacre because yeah. really you only actually is this right i mean you only really franklin is the only character that is actually kind of properly yeah. killed by the yeah. chainsaw yeah. isn't he yeah as well. he is he's the only chainsaw see one kid. death by a chainsaw yeah yeah, yeah. it's so funny yeah it should be the texas chainsaw skirmish or yeah something. that's what they should have called <laughs> it's it. just so brilliant but again you the first time you watch that you'll swear blind you did watch some yeah. sort of massacre you yeah. know yeah it's wonderful um leatherface then i mean th- you know the way that leatherface because i was thinking about it as well you know compared to slasher characters like michael myers or yeah. 
who kind of have so, Michael Myers is a good example really because he has so much sort of grace and he always seems to be kind of omnipresent and he'll pop up at the place you don't expect him to or whatever whereas there's something completely ungraceful about Leatherface and the way he pops up and appears kind of isn't like he kind of he comes from nowhere he kind yeah. of stumbles and runs around and you hear him coming before you see him yeah. you know there's nothing subtle about him no. is there he's a 22 stone man dressed in an apron, a a mask made from like human skin that's stitched crudely together and whacked on his face with like hardly any peripheral vision. Yeah. You know, he's wielding a sledgehammer or a chainsaw or whatever. And like you said, he's completely graceless. He stumbles around. Um, When he's chasing Sally in the latter stages of a film, every time she turns a corner, like Leatherface skids almost like Keystone (laughs) Cops, you know, because he can't do a turn so quick. And, um, And again, like, Someone like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger has something kind of supernatural or preternatural about them where where you almost feel they can't be killed and where do they come from? Mm. And, and they'll, they'll know, walk, but they'll always catch yeah, up with yeah, you. Yeah, always. Yeah. However fast you run, they're just plodding implacably along. Yeah. But Leatherface, he, he's a complete opposite of that. With the third person, when Jerry comes in and he kills Jerry, he hits him with a hammer. He's then like he has this wonderful moment where he's running around the house in a panic because he's like, where are these people coming from? And he's looking out a window and he's clutching the sides of his head and he's shaking his head and he's like licking his lips with his horrible, like, you know, baby teeth, his malformed teeth. There's a close up of the mask. And yes. it's all this thing where you almost feel sorry for him. He, he's mm. like, he, he doesn't know what's going on. It's and like he's just he, trying to defend his house. He's scared. It's brilliant. It's like he is in his own little home invasion movie yeah. and he doesn't know what the fuck is going no. on, does he? It's really mad. And, the great thing about Gunnar Hansen in this is they wanted him to be as scary as possible to the people he was killing. So, mm-hmm. so none of the other actors in the film saw him in his gear, in his makeup, oh, like with his mask and his apron and all of that, until the actual scenes when they're shooting the murders. And that particular murder, Jerry, the third one, mm. is fantastic because Leatherface just sort of pounces out a door and hits him with a mallet, and yeah. you know, and and that's it, and it's over. But if you look at the face. The expression on Alan, Alan Danziger, the character, the uh, actor playing Jerry, if you look at his expression, it is pure, unadulterated terror. Yes. Because he's not seen him. He doesn't know what to expect. And suddenly Gunnar Hansen charges out and it's just like with this mallet above his head and he's terrified and it is Absolutely. genuine. It's not acting. That one second of film, watch his face. He is terrified. And again, it just adds to that feeling like you're watching some sort of yeah. snuff. That moment as well when he opens the sort of freezer chest and, yeah. uh, and she's inside yeah. Yeah, is, yeah. is horrible that reminds me of something like maybe something out of something like Night of the Living Dead or something like that it's got that kind of more of a kind of classic horror feel almost yeah. that shot doesn't it like yeah. you're watching some sort of gothic horror or yeah, something yeah it really is it's like the vampire rising from the coffin kind of thing he opens, yeah. opens the freezer she's lying there you think she's dead and she suddenly opens her eyes and sort of sits up suddenly and you know, it's that thing like sloth in seven, you know, yes. it's that classic thing of like exactly. when you think something's dead and it suddenly sits up and it, it, yeah, it's one of the originals and one of the best. Exactly. Because it is interesting because in a lot of ways, this movie doesn't have classic horror film tropes. If you take what was classic horror film up until that point, you know, dark gothic mansion, yeah. shadowy corridors, even Psycho and Night of the Living Dead have a bit of that more yeah. than this in a way. Yeah. It's, you know, um, again, going back to the sort of folk horror link, this feels like it's much more kind of natural, natural lit a lot yeah. of the horror takes place during the day at yeah. least in that first chunk of the movie yeah and it doesn't have the kind of natural what you'd think of off the top of your head as horror conventions does it no it doesn't really it doesn't and again you know there's no super supernatural element to it yeah there's this whole discussion at the moment of what is horror you know a discussion that's gone yeah. on for years and years and years <laughs> but it seems particularly prevalent at the moment and you know elevated horror and all of this yes. nonsense you mm. know but a really traditional way of looking at horror films and how they were regarded, you know, back in the early days were supernatural, you know, like obviously William Freakin never felt The Exorcist was a horror movie because Mm. he felt that it's a kind of documented case and blah, 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 Mm -hmm. you know, and you could take that or not take it. I think he's talking nonsense (laughs) personally. (laughs) But, you know, with, with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's not supernatural. It's just this group of guys who you know no no woman in the house they mm-hmm. you know three generations of men or two generations well three generations because there's granddad and they're living in the house mm. and they're just all as mad as hatters it's extra do you think as well leatherface is kind of almost portrayed as kind of non-gender in yeah. a weird way there's something quite effeminate about him in in some shots isn't there as well well during the course of a 
film, I think he wears three different masks. Yes. And the final mask at the dinner table scene is a woman's mask. That, right. Uh, he's got almost like a sort of permed hairdo yes. and he's got his lipstick on and all of this. And the reason is, and he's got his apron on, and the reason is, is because he's been preparing dinner. So presumably yeah. it's the people who were killed earlier in the movie, sort of Pam and Kirk, but mm-hmm. there's these sausages on the table and chicken. <laughs> and uh, he, he's been off preparing dinner. So he's now like doing his domestic he's chores. He's now the housewife. And, you know, yeah. a lot of people have said that it's a satire of a nuclear family. Yes. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, you know, and you've got the teenage son in The Hitchhiker. You've got, you know, Pop. The sort of and patriarch. Got, yeah, yeah, Pop. And then you've got Leatherface being mom at this particular point. So, yeah, there's a lot in there. Um, Gunnar Hansen also said that he always felt that Leatherface, the character, has nothing beneath the mask. Mm. That whenever he wants to have a bit of personality it's whatever mask he's got on that is his personality right. and there's that wonderful shot there's one close-up of his face in the mask where you can see his eyes and you can see his mouth as he licks his lips yes and the eyes are just completely dead yes there's dead. nothing there yeah right. <laughs> it's, it's horrible uh so then at that point onwards that's when the film becomes what feels like to- then torture basically all yeah. the way through to yeah. the end isn't yeah. there when it when nighttime hits franklin is killed yeah and then that chase sequence begins yeah. sally i hear something stop stop <laughs> which i swear i i swear to god i thought it went on for about 20 minutes and yeah like i say i kind of timed it this time mm. around it's about six minutes before she then gets to the the gas station yeah. and things calm down again for yeah, a minute for a bit but the pacing of it is perfect i think yeah. because i think it knows just how far to push you yeah before it lets you take a breather and then plunks yeah. you straight in it again. Yeah. And that's what, basically, for the rest of the film, that seems to be what happens to Sally, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. And it's really bizarre because so many horror movies have done it since where you have you yeah. know, the final girl running through the woods being pursued and yes. all the sort of jump cuts and tracking shots and all of this. And like you said, it, it seems like it's going on for ages. <laughs> I also, I watched the film last night and I thought that scene lasted about 20 minutes yeah. and, and it was over you yeah. know, pretty quick. And then the incredible thing is, after this chase which again we haven't talked about the humor in this film yet yes yes, there is a lot of there's a lot of humor in this film which you don't notice till about a third time you see it because you're (laughs) too busy being terrified but there's a lot of humor you know whether it's the pop character saying oh look what you did to my damn door you know when leatherface has chainsawed it it's like you've got no pride in your home there's a poking (laughs) sally with the broom there's a keystone cops bit of a leatherface skidding round corners you know there's grandpa trying to hit her with a hammer at the end he's meant to be the greatest killer who ever lived and he keeps dropping the hammer in the yes. tin bucket just sort of glancing blows off her head and it's all very very dark sort of midnight black sick humor yeah but it is very very funny you know when it you've is. watched it a few times you begin to think oh this is a really disturbing comedy isn't it it is it actually is isn't it but i never would have thought about the first time i watched no. it every single moment you just listed from the poking with the broom yeah. to grandpa those were the moments that i found excruciatingly yeah. painful the first that, time I watched that's the weird thing and the yeah. reason i was bringing up the humor now is because in that chase through the woods yes. there's a lot of it in there as well that you know you've got Marilyn Bur- Burns playing Sally charging through the woods and you've got Leatherface constantly just behind her yes. and like every time he almost catches up with her and he could just sort of reach out with his chainsaw yes. and like mow her down you know he just seems to stop or he gets caught in a bramble and she manages <laughs> yeah. to get away and she gets like 20 yards ahead and then he catches up again and it feels like it goes on and on forever mm. you know but it's only a few minutes but it's it's almost comical as well as being absolutely disturbing as hell it's yes. comical there scene. is something kind of terrifyingly comical comical about Leatherface and again it's that gracelessness and the way yeah. you feel like he's going to trip on his own chainsaw yeah. at any given yeah. moment don't Completely. you running in the dark you know with yeah. that mask on uh, yeah and then you know that 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 horrible uh, feeling and again it's a, a good kind of folky uh uh, sort of convention there but that horrible feeling of getting to the petrol station and then realizing oh shit you know yeah. he's in on this she's in this big yeah. giant kind of trap yeah. this hornet's nest that she keeps yeah. getting dragged back into again it yeah is, oh. she she gets to that gas station and we like her you know we the viewer we kind of relax for a moment yeah, take a breather she's found some safety and this guy's going to look after her and of course you know he ties her up and puts a sack over her head and gets her in the car, starts prodding her with a broom and mm. takes her back for this uh, terrifying ordeal, you know, the dinner table scene. Where are you, nap-haired idiot? Ah, ah, where are you at? Ah, I've been out on the road. You damn fool, you almost got caught over a dude. 
that nightmarish uh, I, I really love that shot as well when they get to the house the headlights are on and again you yeah. see the hitchhiker kind of yeah. flailing around this silhouette yeah. kind of and again there's something suddenly suddenly it all becomes almost from what starts off filming feeling so gritty and real to almost kind of surreal and nightmarish yeah. isn't it towards yeah, the end suddenly we're moments. so far from being documentary footage yeah. in, in a way the way yeah. it goes on it's really bizarre but also we talk about we've mentioned earlier we, we touched on why this movie gets under your skin so much and it feels yeah. so real and the conditions of making it you know were so intense yes yes uncomfortable and nasty but you can kind of feel it in the cellul- celluloid yeah but that scene in the gas station is another example of it that marilyn burns did i think about 17 takes of that where she charges through the door she slips she falls on her knees and then she sort of gets up and jim cedar's character starts calming her down and stuff and she did 17 takes of that and when you see that scene you know her trout her knees are just bloodied and that is real blood she did it again and again and again her knees were scabbed cut up there's various other things you know he stuffs a dirty old rag in her mouth in that scene and that again they suddenly decided let's put a rag in her mouth and they just found a rag that happened to be you know on the floor that was covered in god knows what and they stuff that in her mouth you'd never get this in a hollywood production these days And then probably the most classic example of it is a scene at the dinner table scene where uh, Leatherface cuts her finger Mm -hmm. and gives it to her granddad to suck on. And he actually, this is one of Gunnar Hansen's favourite stories, but he had a knife, a sort of blunt knife, and he had a bulb, a blood bulb in his hand. And he's meant to, like, you know, squeeze the bulb and a bit of blood comes out. And they filmed that dinner table scene for 27 hours straight. (laughs) because they had to get it done and they filmed it for 27 hours it was 120 degrees under the lights in that room um they were all going absolutely mad almost in the moment like you know it was almost real they just completely lost it and he kept squeezing that bulb in his hand and the blood wasn't coming out it wasn't working and finally without asking permission of anyone he just took it upon himself Gunnar Hansen to take the tape off the edge of a knife and just really cut her finger (gasps) and he sliced her finger and she's screaming in real pain that's real blood and you know they they really did put her through the ringer for this it's unbelievable isn't it yeah there's a good sort of little pocket of movies isn't there at this time The Exorcist is full of it as well these kind of almost just equally as terrifying myths behind the scenes of the movies that are as scary as the films themselves you know you you never know how much that's the thing I mean how much is apocryphal how much is built up over years and it's a damn good story but you know a lot of it feels very true it's stuff that the filmmakers and Gunnar Hansen's kind of said over the years many many times I I had the good fortune of meeting Gunnar a couple couple of times over the years and um, he actually told me one story I haven't read elsewhere which is um one of the chainsaw scenes where he's actually chasing them with a chainsaw in the house up the stairs. I think he's chasing Sally up the stairs. Um, he had some, uh, he had like, had made some brownies on set and he said, oh, I'll have one of those. And he had a couple of brownies and he didn't realise they were hash brownies and no one had told him. And, ne- and he'd <laughs> never done drugs in his life. And no. next thing he knew, he was like off his head on this hash brownie and he had a chainsaw in his hand and he was chasing Marilyn Burns up the stairs. Oh my and God. like he was completely off his head, which again, maybe it's just a great story. Maybe it's apocryphal, you know, but... But it certainly makes for a, oh my a good, God. good anecdote. It adds a whole other level of fear next time yeah, you watch yeah. it. That's the thing, isn't it? It is. Um, and I've heard, you know, they must have all hated Toby Hooper yeah. during the making of this, yeah. mustn't they? He must but not have been a popular guy. But it's, it's one of those things that now it would never, ever happen. You know, mm. we're now in an age, and quite rightly so, where that, that old idea of, you know, you can do anything for your art yes. and, like, you know, it's worth it because then it's immortalised. You know, we've kind of moved past that, and people now, obviously, you know, you have to look after people set you have to do the right things and there's some things that are more important than making a film but this was back in the day this is a bunch of diy filmmakers you know with a sixty thousand dollar budget it ended up a bit more than that but they're shooting 32 days straight in texas they're trying to make their horror movie they're doing whatever they need to do to make it and it's all just chaos, really. Yeah, absolute chaos. I mean, Toby Hooper is a strange one, isn't he? Because, yeah, we, you know, we, he is obviously, he's one of the greats. He's always regarded as one of the greats in terms of horror. Like we said, nothing's really that he's done as matched up. And also, he's got quite a, he's, it's a real mix, isn't it? When you look at things like Poltergeist, for example, yeah. you'd never know that was really, no. well, I wouldn't have guessed that that is directed by the same man. No. I mean, do you think that there is such a thing as a Toby Hooper film? You know, like you'd know a John Carpenter film, mm. maybe, or mm, would you, you know would. a Wes Craven film? I, I don't think there is like those no. guys. Not like, you know, you know Cronenberg, early Cronenberg. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Carpenter with a sort of classical style. He did sort of chop and change, but then you've got movies. I think Eaten Alive is 
quite similar. Yes, like yes. Aka Death Trap. That's that's quite similar to Texas Chainsaw. You know, a guy, a mad guy in a motel, like feeding his guests to an alligator. Yep. You know, and it, again, it has that sort of seedy quality. It's slightly yeah. more garish, and it's you know slightly more theatrical than Texas Chainsaw. But it it does have that sort of nasty quality where again it kind of gets under your skin. But then he made so many different movies, like Poltergeist. You know, was it Spielberg directed? Feels was, like a Spielberg yeah, film. Yeah, in many it? ways, yeah. was it Toby Hooper? But then the Fun Houses are really bizarre. One, yes, because that, in a way, it's that sort of carnivalesque horror, and it's you know fun for all the family, and it's kind of you know it has that sort of fun, like watching something like Gremlins, that kind of horror yeah. movie. Yeah. But in another way, it's really sick and twisted and nasty, and it's almost like he takes two completely different subgenres of horror. And clashes them together. And I actually quite like the fun house. But but yeah, and then he did like, you know, Life Force, Invaders from Mars, his sci-fi films. Yeah. And, you know, he was kind of all over the shop. There's yeah, so many which is great. Ones. You know, he's eclectic, I suppose. That's the thing. It is, uh, yeah. It's interesting, though. I've heard, you know, other directors talk about him. I think it was John Landis on one of those documentaries saying... You know, when you first watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's like, you know, when you watch a Hitchcock horror movie or something like yeah. that, you know, you're kind of in safe hands. Yeah. Where something very unsafe no. uh, about being in Toby Hooper's hands in that but film. That, that's what makes Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. You know, one of the many things. But Wes Craven famously said, and I'm sure probably someone else has said this on mm-hmm. one of your uh, podcasts, because it's a very f- famous quote. But he said, a director of a horror movie, you know, you have to watch a horror movie thinking you're in the hands of a madman. Yeah, you have to, you know, really not trust, and they could do anything. And Wes Craven certainly did that on Last House on the Left yes, in 1972. And Toby Hooper does it in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You don't know where it's going. Anything could happen. Is it real? Is it not? It's just. You know, as, as it's not a safety zone. You're not watching it from a distance, thinking, "Oh, this is nice, sort of mm-hmm. fun roller coaster ride, a cathartic way to scare myself." <laughs> it's just traumatic. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's that thing as well. We talked about it recently, even with movies like Hereditary, where it it's the discomfort that's added to the scares. That's a great thing because, much as I love the horror genre, and there's so much diverse, challenging work out there, yeah. you know, and a lot of it doesn't get a mainstream release. You know, a lot of it goes straight to DVD or whatever. But if you go to a festival like fright fest 70 films there's Mm. so much good stuff out there but there is no doubt a strand of horror which is very generic yeah and very sort of cliche ridden and it obeys all the tropes and you know exactly where it's going and that's the last thing you want from a horror movie (laughs) you know how are you going to unnerve someone if you know every beat along the journey and when you get a film like hereditary comes along and it sort of takes a sharp left turn here and there and sort of pulls the rug out then you're you're in a different world work, work yeah. altogether. It's the same thing with Kill List, isn't it? First yeah. time I watched Kill oh, List, and man. I was going, "What the hell is this I'm watching?" Yeah, you know? exactly. It takes yeah. a sort of two or three ninety degree turns. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And and you know what's also brilliant about this is that yes, you know we've touched touched on this already, but compared to movies of these other kind of exploitation mm. movies of the seventies, this doesn't really have anything exploitational no. in it. No. And you know we might as well talk about that and talk that sort of dinner table torture yeah. scene again we call it a torture scene that's not really to- I mean no. it's basically just shouting and laughing yeah. and, and making noises yeah. for yeah. sort of 10 minutes isn't it yeah <laughs> She, she's tied up and she's just screaming and rolling her head and there's many close-ups of her eye and, yeah. you know, eyes and just like, you know, bloodshot with terror. And they're just reacting to her and they're yeah. just taunting her. But whatever she does, if she screams, they scream, you know, they laugh at her, they all giggle at each other. Leatherface sort of prances around the table, the hitchhiker's going mad in his unhinged way, kind of, you know, dancing from foot to foot. Yeah. But they don't actually do anything. They don't sort of get out a knife and start, you know, slicing bits off or anything no. like that. It's it's just like you said, it's just they're uh, taunting her and yet it is absolutely horrible. It's like and, a bunch of sort of playground kids, isn't it? Yeah. Or something, you know, teasing somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's such a disturbing scene without anything graphic in it. Yeah. It is such a disturbing scene. You like this thing? 
And that's the thing I couldn't believe watching it last night. I actually thought I'm going to time this scene because mm-hmm. I was convinced that I've, I actually remembered it as the last half hour of the film. It's yes. a dinner table scene. Yes. And it's eight minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> but, Again, the pacing is incredible. It is absolutely incredible because he knows just how long to make something yeah, so yeah. that it is arduous and torturous, yeah, yeah. but never veering into boring. That's no, the thing. Or no, tiresome. No. It's really, really clever. And those extreme close ups again of the eyeball oh, no. and that kind of thing it's they oh. just they just get closer and closer it's yeah like you get to her eyeball and you're almost like going into her eye. yes so it's just the white of her eye and you can see every capillary every sort of you know li- little trail of sort of bloodshot eye it's just it's horrendous yeah again that must be so awful for her to yeah. have to yeah. marry sure it was it? Yeah. <laughs> and then that end but that end moment she bursts out of the window it's something so amazingly cathartic at that moment when she yeah. bursts out and it's daytime again yeah. Yeah. i was really confused by that why is it daytime yeah. because it was dinner time wasn't it yeah. but, <laughs> but i think they're probably eating late let's yeah, give them the benefit of, well, the, exactly, of exactly. the doubt and also it does feel like we've just said that scene last eight minutes but it does feel like it goes on for hours and hours totally. and hours so i i have never even thought about that when she bursts out the window it's obviously sort of sunrise it's, it's early, gone on all it's night early morning but it has it's gone on probably for like six seven hours basically, yeah exactly like exactly her. and it doesn't matter because it works so well you know again it kind of it adds to the kind of weird surrealist yeah. nightmare that she's then just escaped yeah. from yeah. but everything previously to that is just what is it's like in another world or something yeah. almost um yeah and then you know that incredible sort of final sequence where she oh. she escapes and she gets on the back of that truck and that laugh that kind of final sort of oh. Oh. maniacal laugh that she does that's kind of screaming laughing crying i mean what is well, that, it it's... that's the thing i mean before nice of the living dead you know horror movies they had to have a resolution even something like psycho as yes. shattering as it was and you know changed all the rules but it still got its tidy little explanation at the yeah. end and stuff like that and then you know in nice of the living dead it suddenly our hero is shot pointlessly right at the end yeah. and, and it's such a gut punch and then in texas chainsaw massacre you've got two things going on number one you've got sally who she survives she gets in the back of a, a pickup truck and she's going off into the to the horizon but she's absolutely insane you know she's yes. she's lost it you you don't ever get the sense that in a week's time she's going to be okay and no. everything's fine you you know you just get the sense that she is properly unhinged and then you get Leatherface, who's still out there. Mm-hmm. You know, final shot of a movie. He's pinwheeling with his chainsaw, like wielding it about like it's a toothpick. And he's just, he's also absolute lunatic, yes. just doing that. And then suddenly, it, like, you know, goes, the screen goes to black, boom, Cut. and the credits roll. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, like, there's no resolution whatsoever. There's you know, nothing. Imagine he's still like, out there. Yeah, yeah. Everyone at the drive in theatres then have to start at their cars and go home with that. It's Can like, you imagine? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's like a it's like an uh, um, it's again something that you see, you know, it's like the Michael Myers disappears from the yeah, garden yeah. In, in Halloween, yeah. isn't it? But there's something again so much more deranged about the way this yeah. one works. Yeah. It's no. wonderful. And you know, you see so many movies from then on out, the slasher movies where the final girl gets away and there's a kind of calm moment and suddenly she'll yeah. actually be quite calm and she'll be in the back of an ambulance or yeah, something yeah, and it will yeah. all be quite you know but you just think actually that's probably more of a realistic interpretation yeah, of somebody yeah. that's just escaped that you know what Marilyn Burns is doing yeah <laughs> so just briefly I mean when the film came out what was the mm. kind of general reaction to it what did critics and audiences think of it I think it got kind of mixed reviews it, it was not a case of one of those films where everybody hated it and yeah. slammed it and then over the years you know people re-evaluated it it's now rated one of the great horror movies i think there were people out there who really rated it it played in the director's fortnight at Cannes film festival Mm. um which is a bit of an honor i think alexander walker called it the most pure horror film ever made you know yeah it's pretty accurate yeah stuff like that um you know obviously some people a lot of people also hated it because it was so like you know shattering and nasty in a way and gleefully sadistic is a term I keep using so it upset a lot of people and they were unprepared for it but it was a case of it kind of got mixed reviews and then over the years it's just gradually been hoisted up on this pedestal that Mm. you know total film a few years ago probably about five six seven years ago we did a poll of the greatest horror movie ever like everyone has yeah but I really tried to uh 
do it wide reaching and you know horror experts so i was getting as many film critics who really know their horror movies to vote as possible and as many filmmakers and we had lots of famous people took part in it wes craven guillermo oh, del toro yeah toby hooper uh Lo- joe dante loads and loads and loads of people most people actually i asked took part in it and we had like hundreds of people vote and texas chainsaw massacre came number one there you go you know it's just so- just picked the exorcist yes because it's, it's it's always one of those two isn't it or yeah, maybe the shining yeah, as well yeah, it's, that's it's, always it's up those there. Th- it's those top three isn't yeah. it and, and there was it f- what felt like quite a long time when the exorcist did used to top yeah, those did. sorts of lists didn't before it? the exorcist it was psycho yeah, then, yeah yeah then yeah, the yeah. exorcist took over and now it's like texas chainsaw or the exorcist um yeah and i i remember when i was a teenager i used to buy fear magazine i don't know if you yes, remember that, yes 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 like a horror monthly i believe it was and they did they did a poll so this would have been the sort of 1987 1988 or something and they did a poll of the greatest horror movies ever and i remember texas chainsaw i think it came joint number two with the thing john carpenter's yeah. the thing and i think psycho was number one if i remember rightly but Back in those days, this was before you could see it. You know, this was banned by James Furman in 1975 and it didn't come out till 1998. And being a big horror fan as a teenager, I tried to get my hands on all the banned films like you do. And a lot of them I managed to get, you know, Clockwork Orange, a few others. I managed to watch on various dodgy cassettes. I yes. <laughs> I could I could never ever get anywhere near Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, no. and then when I read this in Fear magazine, it was like, oh my God, not only is it, you know, with that title, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm. and the tagline, you know, who will survive and what would be left of them. Not only did I have to see it because of that, but it sounded so like fucked up basically yes. but also it was so rated it's like all these horror experts are saying it's the second best horror movie ever made and i couldn't get my hands on it i actually didn't see it until i managed to get an american video cassette of it i had mm. a sort of joint region video player and i was probably about 24 wow. I reckon, the first time i saw it yeah yeah yeah. Um, it would have been around about 1996 yeah and um so only and, a couple of years before it, or yeah, before, years before it, it came, came out in 1998. Yeah. yeah, so I I got it and I watched it, thinking, you know, it can't possibly live up. I've been trying to watch this film for like 12, 13, 14 years, and everything I've read about it, it can't live up to it, and it did. It's so interesting, it isn't did. it? So yeah, so what exactly happened with uh, the way that the film was kind of banned then or pulled from release? So James Furman, who was the head of the BBFC, he saw it in 1975 and felt that it was unreleasable, you know, that it was mm. just too much, the pornography of terror. And then he went through the film almost frame by frame to see what they could cut out in order to get it a release and decided they couldn't cut it because it's that stick of rock thing. It's just all pervasive horrible start to finish there's no scene where it's like a big gout of blood or anything you know so there's nothing they can take out it's just the atmosphere of it um so he just decided it couldn't be released so it was banned so basically from 1975 in the uk to 1998 when james Furman retired it wasn't available so Mm. it actually wasn't you know it got caught up its name is always mentioned with video nasties and films that were prosecuted and stuff but it wasn't really a part of that because it had been banned since like 80 since 75 but um where it gets ridiculous is james Furman. he he said the famous line which always gets quoted is he said oh it's fine a middle class intellectual watching this film at the nft but imagine the effect it would have on the average car worker in birmingham (laughs) oh um, there's so much wrong with that there's so much so much wrong with it yeah but yeah so so that's why he banned it um and then it got to the point it almost became his personal bugbear and he even banned the word chainsaw from oh titles so when you had all these sort of horror movies flooding the video market in the 80s they weren't allowed to have a title chainsaw so there was a movie hollywood chainsaw hookers came out yes. which actually stars gunnar hansen he's oh. in it uh, and he banned the word chainsaw so it came out in the uk as hollywood hookers you know had right. to take yeah, out yeah, a chainsaw yeah. so it's absolutely mad and then where it's incredible is when james Furman moved on in 1998 and it was resubmitted and it got a release into multiplexes and then later came out on dvd etc when it came out in multiplexes after all these years of being almost mythical the holy grail of horror movies you know is it a snuff movie all of this it's been banned all these years it's suddenly you could walk through leicester square and you'd see it on billboards you know at at multiplex cinemas playing with rugrats and a bug's life (laughs) 
That's just incredible. Absolutely mad. <laughs> incredible. Aren't we glad now that you can pretty much see anything you want whenever you want? But has it taken away... There, there was something about all these movies that gave them even more power, wasn't yeah. there, by the fact that they weren't available for all these years? Yeah, I mean, it, it was almost like a badge of honour. Yeah. When, when I was a teenager and you were desperate to see something, when you finally got your hands on it, there was a big um, factory uh, in my hometown, mm. the Avon Rubber Factory, and all the guys who worked there, you know, they used to get hold of videos. God knows how they did it. So they were the dads of the kids I was at school with. And yeah. every now and then a kid would come in at school and he'd suddenly say, I've got a Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Or I've got The Exorcist. And we used to all gather around the TV and watch it, you know, in a group. And it was suddenly one you could tick off the list. And it was a real badge of honour, almost like, you know, collecting panini stickers or something. You were yeah. ticking them off. So in a way, I really, really miss that. But I, <laughs> I used to love the mystery of it all and, you know, the excitement and when you finally see it. But having said that, you know, it was terrible at yes. the same time that these films were being banned, obviously, yes. needlessly in like 99.9% of yeah. cases. And, um, and yeah, you know, there's something great about today's climate and the fact that you can just, you know, order things online or go on YouTube or whatever and see all these films because they should be readily available, you know. Yes. Film scholars, film fans, anyone with a passing interest, if you want to watch a film, watch a film. Because I remember there was that wave of around the turn of the millenniums when I started seeing all of these movies when they were all getting re-releases, it felt yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. Um, suddenly we were able to see Cannibal Holocaust and I Spit on Your Grave. It's when and James Furman retired. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, and also the kind of the the dawn of DVD as well. Yeah, and I think yeah, they were all getting yeah. DVD releases, weren't they? The Exorcist and all yeah. of these movies I was suddenly seeing, and and so many of them really. I think those exploitation films, especially yeah, are, a lot are, of the video actually, nasties. As, as is always the way, like you said, you know, you build it up, and then they're never actually as good as no. as you think. They're always just a bit unpleasant, but yeah. not actually that well made. Yeah, I think yeah, you know, yeah. uh, I spit on your grave and those types of movies. Yeah. And again, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is just so entirely different to that. Yeah. But it it still has that notoriety. I know a lot of people who, you know, not hardcore genre fans, but they will be like, oh yeah, I like, I love Halloween, that's scary, I love this. Oh no, I'm never watching the Texas Chainsaw no. Massacre, I've heard that's too much, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's so funny, and no one will be- believe you that when you say, no, there's no blood in it, or there's, you know, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. No, they don't. I mean, just the title itself is terrifying. It's the title, it, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think it's the greatest title. We've just said it's the greatest horror movie, I think it's the greatest title as well. It's like, chainsaw what a word massacre what a word and then yeah. texas makes it yes it's just putting texas in there it's like you it know. is and again that makes it feel like a true crime doesn't yeah. it that's that adds to that yeah it really does and bizarrely i'm sure you know this but when they were making it you know that wasn't the title they were going to all sorts they had they? leather face they had stalking leather face they had head cheese which head is very bizarre which was just a working title so i don't think they seriously considered that and the first time gunner hansen knew it was called a texas chainsaw massacre is when he sat down to watch it like the cast and crew screening or whatever when it was finished and he was absolutely gutted because he you know while it was called Leatherface and stalking Leatherface you know it's all about him and suddenly it's like oh the Texas Chainsaw Massacre what you know <laughs> this is true me off my pedestal yeah that's brilliant that's true though and it's and, and, and a, in a weird way it's not all about Leatherface that's no it's the thing. not it's, it's not yeah it's about the family and it's watch, so much more watching it again I mean the family yeah, everyone concentrates on Leatherface but you said earlier how much you like uh, the hitchhiker and, yeah he terrifies I, I think Jim Seadale playing the sort of older brother as well is, is brilliant. It's a phenomenal performance. The yeah. way his face changes, you know, absolutely. It's just... And again, you know, putting Texas in the title as well. It's that sense of place. It's got it such is, a sense it of it place. Really is. The landscape, the smell, the atmosphere. And everything. you just think of Texas as you know. <laughs> again, this is a city dweller being afraid absolutely. of rural backwards and that. But you do think of Texas as this kind of almost a country unto itself. Where, yes. Where it's like who knows what goes on down there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey of A Time to Kill. Renee Zellweger of Jerry Maguire. Are you having fun here? <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The next generation. If looks could kill, he wouldn't need a chainsaw. Uh, before we finish very very briefly as well I just want, I have got to ask you about all of the sequels so we had a two ah. three the return whatever it was the beginning you know the the remakes there was a Leatherface last year you know what did, briefly are any of them any good in your opinion I think the first remake the Marcus Nispel one in 2003 the Platinum yeah. Dunes one 
I think is decent. Yes, it's, I, it's competently made, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot slicker mm-hmm. than the original. It has that kind of, you know, Michael Bay sheen to it. Yes. But it is nasty. It's intense. It's an experience. And I think as far as the horror remakes, we had all these remakes in the noughties, you yeah, know, of all do. these classic horror movies from the 70s. You know, like John Carpenter films remade and all this. And I yeah. think it's one of the better ones. Yes. You know, it's a lot better than Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, yes. The Fog. You know, all of yes. these remakes, it's, it's much better than them, but it's still not a patch on the original. Then I think when you start looking at the prequels and stuff, you know, I, the beginning, I, I think they're absolute disasters. Terrible. And what what's interesting, it's that old thing of trying to reveal a character, you know, Leatherface, yeah. like we said earlier, there's, there's nothing to him. He's kind of blank beneath the mask. And the moment you start to try and explain him and sort of say, oh, you know, he's got bad skin or whatever, mm. and he was bullied at school, it, it takes away the myth. Yeah. And it's very interesting, actually, that um, in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, apparently Toby Hooper did play with the idea. I think they even shot it one scene where he removes his mask, mm-hmm. Leatherface removes his mask, and you kind of see the person beneath, and then they very wisely discarded it. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny, isn't it? There was that whole wave of wanting to over-explain these yeah. types of things. You had they Rob Zombie's stuff. Halloween, even. Yeah, you know, Michael, yeah. It's been, and, and, and now it's gone back the other way again. Yeah, it's like it Halloween is now, he's the shape again in yeah, this next exactly. one, isn't he? And that kind of thing. And then, it? obviously, that's all the sort of modern ones we're just discussing there. But if you go back, there's also the sequels, you know, yes. the original sequels. Toby Hooper made Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Very weird, that film. It's it so tonally weird. different, isn't it? <laughs> it's a film I've grown to quite like over the years uh-huh. uh, originally the first time I saw it I hated it yes. because it is so different to the first and it almost felt to be like you know like pissing on the original it, d- it does it feels Do like it's taking I mean? the it's, piss out yeah, of the original it's yeah. like the original like we've said is completely sexless and the mm. second one you know has sex in it he's mm. kind of wielding his huge phallic chainsaw you know between women's legs and stuff yes. like that and the comedy is far higher in the mix you know and Much. all of this and it, it just felt disastrous to me but the more i've watched it over the years i've gone back to it a few times i actually there's quite a lot i admire about that now it's okay. still, still not a patch but but i do as, as a weird sort of satirical film i quite enjoy it the third and fourth ones i think are pretty bad i mean yes. they obviously went through the ringer with production problems like the fourth one i think was you know taken out of the director's hands and mm. hacked to bits and he's complained you know that it feels completely incompetent the version yeah. they put out i think it had a lot of problems with censorship but they had to cut out all the sort of gory bits and then it didn't really make sense without them and all of this and of course it stars matthew mcconaughey and <laughs> renee zellweger so weird which is really weird um but yeah but I think they're pretty bad. I've got to admit, I've only watched the third and the fourth ones once each. Yeah, me too, know, me too. Back, I barely remember anything about them, to Back be sort of late 90s, I think. And I don't think I'll ever go back to them because I just remember them being disastrous. Yeah, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about... Um, you know the Jason, Freddy, Michael films, and you know all of those sequels. They're all inferior, but they 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 they, they go up and yeah, down do a bit. Some of them, There's don't they? Ones, I feel yeah. like the Texas Chainsaw has the the worst legacy of sequels yeah. uh, compared to the original out of all of I, these franchises. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Yeah, as certain Elm Street movies, Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah. you know, going you, deep into the franchise that I have time for. Absolutely, you know, not yeah. classics, but I have time for them. I, I don't, you know, I have a bit of time for the second Texas Chainsaw, but apart from that. Mm. No. no and maybe that's because also because we love the first one that that much more maybe yeah. as well but but yeah. yeah um brilliant well thank you so so much uh jamie for for joining me uh, it's been all. so much fun to talk about the movie um just i was gonna ask you i mean you've uh, usually i ask everyone what your favorite horror movie is you've already told me obviously it's texas chainsaw yeah. massacre but another question what's your scariest ever horror movie unless that's the same answer again or do you have a kind of scariest horror movie experience well, it is the same answer again mm-hmm. in that, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the one that I can't shake. Yes. Like we've mentioned a few times, I've only seen it four or five times, but I, I seriously have a repetitive dream. I probably have it once every month or every two right. months about the Texas Chainsaw and have since I watched it, like in 1996, where I dream I'm on the farm, I'm being chased by Leatherface with his saw. Uh, it usually ends it's one of those weird dreams where it's always the same you know as that same beats and I run up the stairs and I get cornered and he approaches me with a chainsaw and I always wake up at that moment 
apart from one time I didn't wake up and he actually started hacking my limbs off in the dream and I died in the dream which apparently you're not meant to do but if you die in a dream you die in real life yes yes. someone told me obviously nonsense yeah yeah. I was lying there dead at his feet in the dream which is odd but the point being that it really has soaked into me and I I find it very very scary and I sort of live with me but in terms of other scary movies, I mean, over the years, you kind of, I've seen so many horror movies, you almost become like immune to it. Yes, in, a bit numb to it, yeah. In, in a way. Um, but having said that, you know, the odd one still gets under my skin. The first time I saw Paranormal Activity, the first Paranormal Activity, yeah. that really got to me. I was really distressed watching that, like, yeah. curled up in a fetal ball. Um, you know, I still, I'm a sucker for a good atmospheric, scary film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they, they occasionally get to me. I, I found hereditary distressing more than scary, but I agree. Yeah. But it was distressing. Um, yeah. So there's still a few over the years when I, obviously when you first start out when you're a teenager, that's when they used to really get to me. Yeah. Like when I, I mentioned earlier about going back to horror with Nightmare on Elm Street, but that oh, yeah. absolutely, I was about 14. That absolutely terrified me. All the Friday the 13th films, which I pretty much watched back to back as a teenager. Yeah. I think they were up to about number seven when I started. Right, right. I watched like the first seven in the course of about a week or something. And they all <laughs> they all absolutely terrified me. Like, you know, going back to some of them since, it's like, well, how did they terrify me? I know, you? But, it's funny, isn't but it? They did, but yeah. But yeah, but yeah, I just love the genre. Oh, <laughs> love it, that. love it. And then finally, do you know, it's been, what, 45 years since since Texas Chainsaw, wow. or nearly 44. How uh, Do you think it still holds up all these years later? Is there anything about it that's dated? I think it does hold up because it was made so kind of artfully artless, is yes. how I'd put it. That is a great way to put it. So yeah. because of that, I think it totally lives up because it hasn't dated in terms of its style but almost you know when it came out it almost felt like a diy sort of home movie snuff movie and because of that it sort of still feels like that it still feels like someone grabbed a camera in the early 70s and filmed these like true life events yes um edited it brilliantly um yeah yeah so i don't think it's aged for that i'm just trying to think maybe maybe granddad's makeup yes you know, that's true a, we didn't talk about granddad yeah. but yeah that's an interesting he's like, uh, uh, the, the most com- comedic yeah. element of the film isn't yeah it? yeah he's meant to be something like 108 years old and he's played <laughs> yes. by an 18 year old and it's one of those cases where they put him in makeup for about 10 hours or something yeah and there's a couple of shots in the movie where he looks absolutely fine and it looks really authentic and then there's a couple of other shots obviously watching it now with advances and also watching it in hd now mm-hmm. There's a couple of shots in the film where it just looks like a terrible latex mask, you yes, know, yes, yes. which kind of snaps you out of it. So maybe that's where it has an age. But I think, you know, 95% of it has aged terrifically. Yeah. And again, it's that lack of, in a weird way, the lack of blood, the lack of practical yeah. effects has also aged it better, hasn't it? Yeah, that's completely. Yeah. Completely. Stuff like that doesn't age. I mean, it's like... If you're watching CGI, what's great CGI, you know, one decade, the next decade really looks ropey. If you're watching prosthetic or practical effects or a lot of hosing blood again, Mm. it can be fantastic at the time. And then, you know, it can maybe look a bit hokey as you go on and things improve. But with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because it goes back to the old sort of traditions of horror, that it's like suggestion. Yes. You know, it's all in the mind's eye. Um, It can't age for that love it um jamie thank you so much for joining me um thank if people you. want to find you sort of social media that kind of thing find what you've written that sort of thing where's best to look well basically you can just uh you can google me obviously um i write quite a bit for sunday times culture total film obviously editor at large um you can go online there's a lot of my pieces on um games radar reviews uh, mm-hmm. they basically um house all of total films online content um, on Twitter, Jamie underscore Graham nine, um, always tweeting away. Um, so yeah, by more, if anyone's got any questions, any more questions about the film, we've obviously discussed a lot today, but there's probably a lot we haven't touched on. Oh, we'll go on so forever, much more. I know there's ever so much more. and ever. But yeah, by by all means, by all means, drop me a line. I'm more than happy to engage in conversation. Love it. Thank you so so much. And that's it for this week. Well, thank you so, so much for listening. And a big thank you to my brilliant guest, Jamie Graham. Such a pleasure to finally get him on the podcast. And for this week especially, what a treat. So what do you think of this week's show? What do you think of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Do you agree with me and Jamie that it is the greatest horror movie of all time? 
or is it overrated? Let me know your thoughts. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com or you can find us on Twitter at evolutionpod or on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash evolutionofhorror. There is also a discussion group, the Evolution of Horror discussion group. That's where you can discuss this week's movie and the podcast and any other horror-related topics with fellow listeners. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group and that can be found on Facebook. So where do we go now in our journey through the evolution of folk horror? Well, this week and last week, you know, Straw Dogs, Deliverance, Texas Chainsaw, we've been moving into this kind of subgenre of a subgenre, I suppose. We're really kind of going down a rabbit hole here. Uh, but um, a kind of arm of folk horror that we've mentioned already. It's known as Hicksploitation. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting titles and a lot of interesting movies to cover within the umbrella of Hicksploitation. A few too many to cover, in fact. So what do I do when I've got lots and lots of movie titles that all need covering in one week, I bring in the brilliant Brad Hansen. So next week, I'm going to be joined by Brad, and we are going to be talking very broadly about all things exploitation. This is going to be a spoiler-free discussion, and as ever with Brad's episodes, we are just going to be going through a list. He's compiled a list of his 10 exploitation recommendations. We're going to be covering everything from 70s movies like The Hills Have Eyes, all the way through to 21st century movies such as E. Eden Lake or Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Loads of incredible stuff to cover. And you don't have to watch anything in advance. Have a listen, bring your notepad, jot down a few titles that we recommend. So join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.